you. You're not deaf. You're kind of Halloween costume, and not a very good one at that. Look at you. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Who are you? I am deaf. No, you're not. Let me see who you are. You are deaf. Told you so. Then I'm dead. Where are we? Is this heaven or is this hell? This is actually Manchester. I've died and gone to Manchester? Why Manchester? Well, it was the only thing available at the time, given the circumstances. Well, it's not good enough. I want another opinion. I want to talk to your supervisor. Oh, you have just made a terrible mistake. But I gotta say, you have guaranteed that you will not stay in Manchester. Good. Where am I going? Oh, we are now sending you to Concord. No! And not just Concord. You will now be in the New Hampshire State Legislature. Eternity in the House of Representatives. No! No! No, 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 no! It was the night of the summer solstice, June 21st, 1937, three o'clock in the morning, Monday. Dr. Frank Sickles was on his way home to Pentecook after a difficult night at the state hospital there in Concord. There'd been an emergency with an inmate heart attack. The inmate had survived. But Dr. Frank had been up and working 14 straight hours. That night, his was the only car on the road. As he passed the Old North Cemetery, a figure appeared at the gate and ran right into the road. He, of course, slammed the brakes of his 1936 Lincoln Zephyr, but it was too late. He hit the woman square on. But just as he hit her, as it would, time slowed down, and through the windscreen, the woman, as she came up over the bonnet, made eye contact with the good doctor and he recognized her. It was the Princess Carolyn de Faussonnier Lusange. No doubt about it. And she was smiling. But see, the problem was the princess was dead. She had been dead now for eight months. As the car hit her, there was this whoop sound like a pillow slamming on a bed and then the soft sad wail that trailed off like it was moving far away and then the inside of the windshield fogged up and there was a very very faint smell of perfume well dr frank pulled the car over of course ran back looked up and down the road nothing no sound no victim no damage to the car hello he yelled where are you that was the very first time, the very first time, the ghost of the princess was seen. But you know, within an hour of the Concord incident, the princess was also seen in the hallway of the Mount Washington Hotel up in Bretton Woods. A chef on his way to the kitchen to get ready to prepare for breakfast, he saw her and he thought nothing of it. He pulled his forelock to her as she passed, but then he realized who it was and he looked back she was gone. Now, in case you don't know, Princess Caroline de Faussonnier Lusange was, let me tell you, she had been the owner of the Mount Washington Hotel there in Bretton Woods. That's why the chef knew her. At the time of the construction of the Mount Washington, the princess was the second wife of the man who built it, Joseph Stickney. He was a coal and railroad magnate and a millionaire from Concord. Her maiden name was Carolyn Foster. They married in 1894. She was 27, he was 54. That's 27 years, her senior. And of course, he spoiled his new wife shamelessly, and she loved him to death. 
But he died in 1904, only one year after the hotel was completed. Carolyn moved to Europe, but she returned each summer to oversee things at the hotel. She always stayed in the rooms she and Joseph occupied. In 1913, she met and married Prince Aymon de Faussignier Lusange. The couple lived in Paris, except in the summers, when they came back to Bretton Woods. Prince died in the spring of 1922. Caroline died in 1936. She is entombed in a classic Greek mausoleum there at the North Cemetery. And the man she occupies the sepulcher with is not Prince de Faussigny Lusange, rather in death. Caroline lies beside the man she loved most in all the world, Joseph Stickney. Her ghost, by the way, still haunts the Mount Washington. Her spirit has been seen more times than any other ghost in New Hampshire, maybe all of New England. Almost always they see her on the summer solstice. Why the solstice? Well, because it's the start of the season, of course. This is a story my grandfather used to tell every Halloween. See, grandfather, he was friends, actually grandfather and grandmother, they were friends with Lemuel and Olive Dooley. And the Dooleys lived in an old farm out on Polk Road in Benton. They had no children, but they did have chickens, a garden, a cow, and an old horse they called Frank. Well. In the middle of a summer night, Olive had a seizure, and she thrashed around so much in bed that she almost woke Lemuel up. Next morning, Lem did get up, went out, milked the cow. When he came back, Olive was still in bed, so he went to wake her. Oh, geez, Lemuel said, Olive's dead. Dang, he said. Now, being a Yankee, Lemuel didn't waste any time. He went right out to the work shed, and before noon, he had cobbled up a sweet little pine coffin. Lem then went back into the house and took the feather comforter off the bed and went back and lined the box with it. He then carried Olive out and put her in the box, and she looked nice. Being summer, it was still light, and he loaded the coffin on the wagon and hitched up the wagon to the horse called Frank, and they started for the old cemetery. He figured he would have enough time to dig the grave before total darkness set in. So Frank and the horse started the last journey for Olive Dooley. Well, they approached the old family cemetery there on Church Hill, and at the gate, Frank the horse pulled one of the rear wheels of the wagon over a small square of granite, and the wagon bucked and Olive in her coffin fell off onto the ground. The cover of the coffin wasn't nailed on yet because Lemuel was going to say a final goodbye to his wife before he put her in the ground. Well, the coffin landed with a bang and Olive sat up. She wasn't dead after all. Wonderful, Lemuel thought. I won't have to make my own supper tonight. Well, Olive got better. And she lived another four years, but then she had another seizure and she died a second time. And this time, Lemmy, he was ready for it. Coffin was still in the workshop and only needed a little dusting, which he did. And he laid out his wife for a second time and then he loaded the coffin onto the wagon, hitched up the horse. And as he got to the cemetery gates, he said to the horse, Now, Frank, he said, you mind that rock this time. You remember what happened before. He said. They expected to find one body, but they found the bodies of hundreds. I'll tell you the story. Binky's friend comes back from the dead to address town meeting. I'll tell you the story on Fritz Weatherby's Haunted New Hampshire.